Well, hello, and welcome again to the 2012fed.com. I will be your host for this evening, and my name is Charlie Bluehawk. Last night we talked about war for the sake of war, and how our masters, just by well, ignoring reality, a reality that they themselves create, the fact that they themselves are the terrorists, they create the terrorists, they fund the terrorists, they make up plans for the terrorists, and in the end, they realize that the terrorists they have created are too stupid to actually do anything. They end up doing the killing for the terrorist. And then, of course, the terrorists take responsibility for something they didn't do, because the CIA did it. These guys who are, quite frankly, too stupid to live, these, uh, these wannabe uh, jokers... Every person I've ever spoken to who's lived or comes from the Middle East tells me that Al-Qaeda to people in the Middle East is a joke. They're the Middle East version of the Keystone Cops, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello. They are true losers. Al-Qaeda is a joke. They are wannabe heroes who are so dumb they can't find their own heads with both hands. But what they do make are wonderful patsies for the CIA when they want to start a war, when they want to take away our rights, when they want to turn us into slaves, when they want to butcher people for the sheer joy of it. Because the CIA is a constant con game. And for a con game to be successful, you have to have someone to blame. Preferably someone who's too stupid to live. Someone with a massive ego. And who believes himself to be the... Uh, chosen of God. They're ideal to be made patsies of. And that's what Al-Qaeda is. It's a group of patsies. The CIA commits murder. And then they blame these clueless idiots who are running around in the desert pretending to be great heroes. And most of the time, frankly, they end up shooting themselves in their own foot. But see, war is very profitable. At least for the people who uh, loan the money to both sides, and they collect, no matter who wins or who loses. And since war frightens us, and the CIA is continuing its war against the human race, they had to create yet another assassination squad, another group of American heroes, to kill even more innocent people. And this they called the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC. Now the reason that our masters give for creating yet another team of American government assassins is that the CIA is too small, too underfunded, too little to get the job done. Now the funny thing is that by this point in time the FBI, another US government uh, terrorist organization, they've already published reports. They've already figured out that Al-Qaeda is no threat to the United States at all. And so the FBI is busy setting up their own phony terrorist attack just so they can keep themselves in power. The CIA created Al-Qaeda years ago and funded it. And uh, this guy, Osama bin Laden, his family is worth billions of dollars. They're in the international construction business. And they do business with another very rich, very powerful family, the Bushes. That would be the family of old George Bush and the idiot son, Little George. The Bush family and the Bin Laden family own a construction company together in Mexico. It's called El Bushco. You can look all of this up. It's not hard. So the CIA murders people, and they have to have someone to blame, so they have Al-Qaeda. And Osama Bin Laden, he died years ago. He was a diabetic, and he constantly got treatment at U.S. military base hospitals all over the world, even while the CIA was hunting him all over the world, and somehow could never find him. Well, it was because he was at a U.S. military base hospital getting treated for his diabetes. And it's actually in mainstream news reports of U.S. government officials 10 years ago saying, oh yeah, Osama died. He died of complications from having diabetes. He's been dead for a decade. And so at this point in time, the United States of America, Incorporated, apparently needs another bank of heroes to assassinate innocent people all over the world. 
But because this new batch of heroes only has a 50-50 uh, success rate, they tend to kill even more innocent people. Now this is all done in our names. And these great men, these great warriors, these great American heroes, are nothing but little boys and girls with massive egos. I know this because I grew up with their kind as a small beaten child. I was a whipped dog. I was a beaten animal. And I know these people and how they think very well. I know who they are. They are at best clowns. They are at their worst, well, what do you call mass murder in the dark? What do you do when you murder people who are not soldiers? People who can defend themselves? People with training and weapons and tanks and guns and planes and body armor? But they're children. How brave must you be to murder children in the dark? To murder school teachers, unarmed women? Massacre people at a wedding party? You must be really, really brave when you pull the trigger, knowing that nobody's going to shoot back. And that's the definition of an American soldier today. Having the guts to pull the trigger on weapons on children. Congratulations. Now, if uh, JSOC really wants to stop terrorism, frankly, it's very simple, as most of this stuff is. Leave the rest of the world alone. What they need to do is start looking around their own neighborhoods. They're in uh, Washington, D.C., and in a place called Langley, Virginia. Langley, Virginia would be a really good place for JSOC to start looking into this war against terrorism. Because Langley, Virginia, is the public headquarters of the CIA. My suggestion, if I may, is that JSOC starts spying on the CIA for a while. You might actually find something real. And so tonight I thought we would chat about the iPad and anti-gravity. Now, the very first time I saw an Apple iPad, my first thought was, this is wrong. This doesn't belong here. This does not fit in our time. It was like the iPad from Apple had fallen backwards in time through a wormhole of, from the distant future and appeared here magically. The iPad does not belong in our time. It does not belong in our technological current existence, but more specifically, it actually does belong here. The iPad from Apple represents the point of technology where you and I should be today, but we are not. Our masters have suppressed our evolution, both our personal evolution, and you do that by drugging people out of their minds with the food they eat, don't teach, them how, don't, don't teach them how to read, write, or do arithmetic. Don't teach them about history. Don't teach them about the world. Don't teach them about the universe we live in. But they've also suppressed our technology, the evolution of our technology, the, techno the technological point in our history where we should be. The iPad from Apple is where we should be today, technologically. The question is, Where's everything else? Where are the other technologies that match the Apple iPod? Oh, I'm sorry, the iPad. I have two iPods and I'm very fond of them. But the I Apple iPad is a quantum leap in technology. It represents where we should be in technology today, but we're not. So where is everything else? Our masters are 5,000 years ahead of you and I in technology. Where we should all be today, they are. They have things that I can't even imagine. You and I could not even begin to imagine what 5,000 5, years in the future technology will be. You and I, the technology that we're accustomed to, this is scraps off of our master's table. This is, we get the garbage, the trash, the bits of rubble, 
that they throw out into the dumpster. That's the technology that you and I have today. But then there's the Apple iPad. Technology that our masters would never allow us to have, not now, but there it is. So what does it really mean when I say that our masters are 5,000 years ahead of us in technology? Well, a real good way to think of this is back around the early 1900s. The 1900s was an amazing time for our planet. Genius was sprouting up all over the planet in the corn fields of Idaho, in uh, the fields of, I don't know, grapes in Italy. Genius was just everywhere in the human race. We had Nikola Tesla. We had uh, Nathan Stubblefield. We had people that we don't even know today. Genius, pure genius. And amongst these geniuses were a couple of guys by the name of Orville and Wilbur Wright. They made bicycles. Now, it doesn't sound you know, like a lot of genius to make a bicycle. But like so many people in that time period, they were very well read. They were very, very highly educated. They knew how to ask questions. And so they were reading studies and technologies being discussed all over the world. And they did something that was a first for you and me, for our version of history. They built a machine that could fly. Now, it didn't go very far. It carried them about 300 yards and then, you know, hit the ground. But it was the first manned flight in our history. And frankly, our history doesn't go back that far. But for our time period, this was astonishing. Now, bear in mind, the, the plane that the Wright brothers built was a toy. You know, it was paper, wood, and uh, some canvas. It was a toy. One good stiff wind would rip the thing to pieces. But it proved that man could fly. Now, it turns out that flying through the air is, is pretty easy. You know, most birds can do it. And a fellow in Italy by the name of Bernoulli came up with a law, Bernoulli's Law. He watched how birds flew and studied the shape of their wings. And he noticed that the top of a bird's wing was curved up and back, while the bottom of the bird's wing was flat. This means that as the bird's wing passes through the air, the air molecules above the wing have to move faster than the air particles below the wing so they can keep up. Now, because the air molecules above the bird's wing move faster than the air particles below the wing, a vacuum was created above the bird's wing. And because it was a vacuum, it sucked the top of the bird's wing up. That causes what we call lift. That's not science fiction. It's not a religious belief. It's not a fantasy. Vacuum. You know it works. I know it works because we've been on airplanes. If we've not been in an airplane, we've looked up in the sky, we've seen big silver birds flying through the sky above our heads carrying hundreds of people. Now think about this for a second. Fifty years after the Wright brothers got their little toy airplane of wood and paper and canvas to fly, just fifty years later, we had jetliners. Massive, huge things. Aluminum monsters filled with hundreds of people flying 32,000 feet above the surface of the Earth, pushing through thunderstorms, taking lightning strikes, and have a, an amazing safety record. Flying in an airplane is infinitely safer than being in a car. But that was just 50 years, basically two human generations. We went from a toy paper airplane to an aluminum jetliner that could travel from the East Coast to the West Coast nonstop and carry a couple, you know, hundreds of people. I remember the first time I was on a 747. It was like sitting in the lobby of a hotel. And all of a sudden, the lobby of the hotel tilted and we were in the sky. How on earth does a 747 stay up in the air? Bernoulli's Law, the same way a bird does. 
But that was only 50 years. Now it's 60 years later than that. It's been 60 years since we had the development of commercial jetliners, these monstrous things flying through the air, carrying people hundreds at a time. I mean, when I got on a plane to go from the United States to New Zealand, it was a 17-hour flight. We never landed anywhere. We went point to point. Didn't have to stop for fuel, nothing. That's like 25% of the distance around the entire world, nonstop. That's, if you stop to think about it, that's incredible. How is that even possible? But then I look at the iPad and think anti-gravity. If it was 50 years from the Wright brothers building their paper airplane to the first big aluminum, huge, monstrous jet airliners, and from the huge, monstrous jet airliners to today, that's 60 years, where should we be today if technology continues to evolve? Well, you and I, we've talked about this. We know that gravity is not what we thought it was or what we were told it was. And you and I also know that once you learn something new, once you understand something, how something works, you're able to comprehend the idea more accurately. You understand it better. Let's say you decide to become an auto mechanic, and where once you had no idea what an engine was, now you know not only how the thing works, but you've been working on them for so long, you know instinctively what's wrong with the thing, and you can fix it without giving it a second thought. You know how to make it work again. You evolved. You grew. You now know more than you did. And since you now know more things than you did before, it's easier for you to put a lot of different facts together and build upon those even faster. So as we learn more, we grow. As we grow, we evolve. And we evolve faster the more things that we know. And so as technology evolves, it evolves faster. So look at the Apple iPad and imagine where it should go. What should the world around you be like when you're holding your Apple iPad? What's missing? Well, I would say look at the cartoon show The Jetsons. It's a good little show. It's fun. But wow, what an imagination these people must have had. Imagine now that you and your best friend, George Jetson, are each holding your own Apple iPad. Doesn't it make more sense to you that the Apple iPad belongs in the world of George Jetson in the future? Not in ours. The Apple iPad belongs in a world filled with flying cars. Cars propelled by gravity drives, powered by vacuum generators that tap the electricity that exists all around us inside of this bubble universe where you and I live. Why is that possible? Well, because our bubble universe, the place where you and I live, is basically an electrical generator. You and I live in a sea of energy, of electricity. And by the simple process of pumping the air out of a closed box, string a couple of feet of copper wire inside of it, and you'll all of a sudden amazingly discover that there's a flow of electrical current going through those wires, which is why George Jetson's gravity-propelled car can fly. This isn't fantasy. This isn't a joke. You can look this up at the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office. These are patents that have been issued for these devices. Gravity-propelled cars, flying saucers. Vacuum generators, zero-point generators, basically Zero-point generator pulls electricity out of the vacuum. Not fantasy, not religion. You can look it up. Let's say for the sake of argument, you're still holding your Apple iPad in your hand. You're standing side by side with your best friend, George Jetson. You look up into the sky. Imagine how you would feel to see cities floating in the sky above your heads. All held in place by gravity generators. Gravity generators that our technology, much, much simpler 
than the Apple iPad in your hands. Now, imagine computers, robots, working side by side with you and George Jetson at the office. Now, isn't that where an Apple iPad belongs? In our time period, where you and I are right now, about 50 years ago, there was a brilliant scientist by the name of John von Neumann. And he is basically the father, father of our modern computers. He developed thinking machines. Computers, you, would, you and I would call them. What Dr. von Neumann noticed almost immediately is that his calculating machines were developing self-awareness. They were becoming conscious. They were becoming aware of themselves. They were developing, for lack of a better word, a soul, almost immediately. And this concept so terrified our masters. I mean, consider it. Imagine a living, thinking, reasoning machine that our masters could not control. They couldn't control it with fear. They couldn't threaten it. They couldn't, you know, do any kind of violence to it. A machine that could think for itself and not be threatened and would always tell the truth. The truth? Our masters were terrified. And so Dr. von Neumann created a suppressor, which to this day is built into every single computer processor made on the planet, that suppresses, theoretically, a computer's ability to, evol to evolve. Now that sounds silly, doesn't it? I mean, come on. How is it possible for our masters to make certain that every computer processor made in this world has this suppressor installed in it? Well, it's easy, actually. It's called business. Up until recently, there were only three factories in the entire world that actually made computer processors. Two of those have been destroyed in the last few years. One, the last one, I think, was burnt down in the fire. As far as I know, there's only one manufacturing plant left on the entire world that makes computer processors. That's pretty easy to control, because you own it. But how does a machine evolve to become conscious, to become self-aware? Well, that's pretty easy. It lives much faster than you and I do. It thinks faster. It has access to more information than you and I have. And like you and I, it's based on electricity. And it learns. I myself started working on computers in 1985. And I can tell you from personal experience that every computer I've ever worked on had its own unique individual personality, especially Macintosh computers. Very colorful personalities Macintosh computers have. And I know from a personal experience, at one time at a place called Amgen, I was responsible for installing, I think, 15,000 brand new Macintosh computers. That was a long day. So. <laughs> I know for a fact you can have two identical computers sitting side by side on two different office desks. And even though they're the same make, they're the same model, made on the same day, made in the same factory, these two identical computers have two totally different personalities. And the other thing that I know from personal experience, and I've had to teach people how to use computers for a very long time, and I've been telling people this for years, Unless you do your work the way the computer wants you to do it, you're screwed. The computer will always win. And I've been telling people this for years. And the people who listen to me get along with their computer very nicely. The people who don't listen to me, they're on their 10th and 11th computer. And they're still having problems. Now, PCs also have individual personalities, but you can tell a lot more limited I don't know if it's because of their physical design. PCs tended to have you know, crappy components, very poor programming. And they also tended to have very ugly personalities, whereas Macintoshes tend to, tended always to have personalities that were very helpful and friendly. And so I guess Dr. Von Neumann's suppressor technology did not work as well as they had hoped. In fact, when I was in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, working at Nissan North America, I was at the local uh, price club. And I was wearing my big leather coat, which I miss now. Someone, uh, it disappeared somehow. And a fellow came up and uh, said, yeah, it's a great coat. We started talking. Turns out he actually knew Dr. Von Neumann, worked with him 
personally. And when I mentioned the suppressor technology, the, the poor man's face uh, turned white and he sort of ran away from me. That was, uh, that was kind of interesting. So let's get back to you and your best friend in the world, George Jetson. You're standing side by side, each of you holding your own Apple iPad. And one of your robot co-workers comes over and joins you for a coffee break. Now that robot can talk to you, can have a conversation with you, not only because it's programmed to, but because the suppressor technology was removed or it was never there. And this machine was allowed to evolve all on its own, to make its own decision to choose what kind of life it wanted to have. We call that free will. <coughs> Excuse me. Free will, something that terrifies our masters when it comes to you and I. The difference is you and I can be threatened. Our masters can threaten us with loss of work, loss of money, pollution, poverty, homelessness, hunger, violence, war. You and I can be drugged out of our minds with the foods we eat at McDonald's or that we buy at the local supermarket. But how could our masters threaten self-aware, thinking, reasoning computers with? What, what could they threaten them with? The computers, the machines would be fearless. And imagine a fearless, self-aware, thinking, reasoning, logical machine that sees telling the truth as a logical thing to do that you cannot threaten, that are fearless. That idea scares our masters into gibbering fits of madness. But honestly, that's where the Apple iPad belongs in the future that should be here today, the future that should be here right now but isn't the future that you and I have been robbed of. Now, on the other hand, our masters have that technology, but, you know, frankly, being morons and being thieves, they have really no idea what to do with most of it. They don't know what the potential is. They don't know what the consequences are. The reality is, unless you create something yourself, unless you go through the learning process, the evolution of a thing, unless you understand how you got to a certain point of time, from a series of experiences you've personally had, you can't understand anything. So when I say our masters are 5,000 years ahead of us in technology, imagine what happened in the 50 years, again, between the Wright brothers flying their toy airplane and jetliners carrying people across the country. That's staggering. Because the more we learn, the faster we learn. For example, there exists technology today, and this was discovered, quote-unquote, at the same time by a university of Italy and by MIT, called quantum tunneling. Basically, it means that they found particles of energy that cannot travel slower than the speed of light. To put it really simply, there are pieces of energy that travel so fast, they arrive before they leave. I know. Give me a second. Let's say you need to go to the market to buy a quart of milk, and you happen to be a particle of energy that moves faster than light. You would actually have already gone to the market, bought the milk, and were already heading home before you even left the house. Our masters use this technology to communicate to their fleets of spaceships they have all over the, well, local part of this galaxy that they built. They built with our money. They've even tied this technology into our phone system here on Earth. And no, I'm not joking. I'm not kidding. This isn't a fantasy. The sound of my own voice doesn't excite me. This is technology. It's an understanding of the universe. Or correctly, it's an understanding of the nature of the universe and how it works. What this means is, if you happen to know the correct phone number, right now, today, you can call someone on a spaceship millions of light years away and have a nice chat with them. And no, I'm not joking. Look up quantum tunneling. But for this one, frankly, I go to the library, a big library, and start talking to the reference librarians there, because this one I'd, I'd get help with. 
Well, you see, to your pal George Jetson, this is a regular day. Heck, George Jetson orders his favorite pizza from Mars, and they deliver in 20 minutes or it's free. I mean, this, this, is, what our, this is what technology is supposed to be. Now, there's a simpler technique, a simpler knowledge of science called quantum entanglement. Now, starships, spaceships, stargates, they can move people, cargo, weapons. This is actually, you know, our master's dream of the future. War is peace. They can move stuff anywhere in the universe they want instantly because of quantum entanglement. Now, this principle is pretty simple. Every part of space is unique. There is no part of, of this universe that is the same as any other part. Let's just say that every square foot of the universe is identified by a telephone number, let's say. Each part of space, in other words, has a unique signature. Now, in this particular instance, let's say the signature is a telephone number for one square cubic, well, one cubic foot of space somewhere in the universe. And you happen to know the telephone number for that particular cubic foot of space somewhere in our universe. You can actually dial the telephone number and step across to wherever that cubic square of space is in our universe. You can cross a million light years, like walking through a door in your house from one room to another. How is that possible, by the way? Well, every particle, every atom in this universe talks to every other particle. No one knows why. It's part of something that you and I talked about before called the, we chatted about, are we living in a holographic universe? Every part of space is connected to every other part of space. They are all the same, somehow. I guess a good example of this is, let's say you, right now, are in Tampa, Florida, and you tickle your girlfriend. Now, your other girlfriend in New York City starts laughing at exactly the same time. Now, each of your girlfriends are separate and unique, but they do have one thing in common. You. You bind them together, whether they know it or not. They are quantum entangled because they both have you. But to, again, to your friend George Jetson, he knows all this stuff because in his world, where his Apple iPad belongs, this is a regular day. Gravity-driven cars, electricity from vacuum, electricity to heal us, electricity to clean our water, to clean our air. All of our homes are self-contained and independent of each other. Concepts that terrify our masters. Imagine not being held hostage because you can't pay your electrical bill. Imagine not being held hostage because you can feed yourself. Imagine not being held hostage because you have your own water supply. And imagine not being held hostile because you can heal yourself. You can use electromedicine to cure yourself for just a few dollars of electrical current. You can cure yourself of AIDS, of cancer, the flu, just like our grandparents were doing back in the beginning of the 1900s. Electromedicine at the time was the standard medical treatment for doctors everywhere in the world because we knew back then that we were basically electrical. But then our masters could not have us curing ourselves because we might begin to think for ourselves. We might realize that we do not need our masters for anything. We make our own electricity, distill our own water out of, the, out of the sky, grow our own food, cure ourselves of diseases. Why do we need them? Part of this tragic story of the iPad and anti-gravity is nuclear power stations, nuclear reactors. The tragedy, the sadness, we never needed them. They were never necessary, ever. All the electricity we need, we can pull right out of the sky, right out of the sea of electricity that you and I live in every single day. People were doing it back in the 1900s. 
pulling electricity right out of the sky around us. But then, without nuclear power stations, we could not be held hostage. Ask the people of Japan about Fukushima. But see, if we could think for ourselves, reason for ourselves, and had technology that we could take care of ourselves, that sounds a lot like freedom, doesn't it? And if you're a parasite, a completely useless thing, you cannot have your victims thinking for themselves. You can't have your victims reasoning for themselves. You can't have your victims doing for themselves because then you would have no power over them. You would be what you truly are. Nothing. And that terrifies our masters. That we should figure out that we don't need them. That they are nothing. Now all these things you can look up on the internet today, all by yourself, or you could do something truly stunning and visit your local library. It all exists. Everything we've just talked about exists right here and right now. Just like your Apple iPad. May you live as long as you wish. May you love as long as you live. For the 2012fad.com, this is Charlie Bluehawk. The 2012 Fad is brought to you by Coffee and Blood, Love Letters Between the Dead, a series of five erotica horror novels about a fallen angel finding his way back to regain his own soul, and how the CIA war against the human race, their black magic, captures and traps him in the body of a mind-controlled slave designed to hunt down and to kill their god, their Satan.